every time you sent me, you know, the next clips to listen to, I would go running because I, I live with my best friend and her brothers. And I literally would go, you've got to hear this. You've got to hear that you did this. This is incredible. I picked the right man. <laughs> Mike was in the kitchen making coffee when his phone rang. He checked the caller ID. Hey, Carl, he said when he answered it. I know it's early, but I got a call back from the guy I asked to look into this house guest of yours. That was fast, Mike said, leaning against the counter. Yeah. Can you meet me at my place in half an hour? I want you to hear whatever it is he found for yourself. You might have questions for him. Yeah, sure, I'm leaving here in five, Mike said, ending the call. He left the kitchen, intending to go upstairs for his shoes and wallet. But he found Tanya standing in the living room next to her suitcase. You going somewhere? She jumped when he came into the room. She hadn't heard him moving at all. You really are light on your feet. She licked her lips. Um, about last night, I, uh, shouldn't have been so forward with you. Kimberly Smith, where are you? I am in Dallas, Texas. I've been to Dallas. I was there very briefly. I went to a radio convention once. In fact, I spent the whole time at the radio convention. It was only a few days, but I did get out to Dealey Plaza, which I found fascinating. It yeah. is a fascinating site, yes. I went to the, the, the museum on the sixth floor of the Texas, or the former Texas Book Depository Building. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a historic, uh, it was a historic place to go and see it for real. Seen it in so many movies and yeah. So, but you're not from Texas, are you? You were born in Colorado. I was born in Aurora, Colorado, Fitzsimmons yeah. General Hospital. <laughs> and so why did you end up moving from Colorado to Texas? Uh, my mom and dad separated and she's from Dallas. So she came back here. And how old were you? I was about 18 months old, I think. I was a little baby. So you were brought up by your mom, your, your mom alone? Yes. And did that mean you had, because instead of sharing, uh, parents sharing responsibility with only having one parent, and I'm guessing your mom would have had to work to make ends meet, um, did that mean you had a lot more time alone than kids with two parents? Actually, no, because I am the youngest of three. Yeah. Um, so my sister is eight years older than me and my brother's seven years older than me. So um, in a lot of ways, I was kind of brought up by my sister as well. OK. All right. So but you still found because I wondered if like, you know, a single parent, maybe you had more time to read, <laughs> you know, and I, develop I, a I, love I of actually, books. I did because my mom used to like to read. My mom was uh, visually impaired. Uh -huh. um, she lost her eyesight when I was about seven. Well, but how bad? What, all the way I, blind? Uh, not totally, but I mean, like she could see uh, bl very blurred images. So, you know, she couldn't drive. She couldn't read a book anymore. You know, everything had to be so close for her to really see it clearly. And she brought up three kids single-handed and was visually impaired. What a hero, what a heroine, what a, what a lady. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and one of them's a best-selling author. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> wow. And what about your eyesight? Is that okay or did it, did it get passed down to you, the bad eyes? Uh, I am actually, of the three, I'm the one with the worst vision. Um, right. I luckily uh, am able to wear corrective lenses, but um, I did in one eye, my mom could be see almost nothing. So my mom's vision was her left eye. She could see almost nothing out of once she went blind and she had the really blurred images in the left eye. Mine is reversed. I have really blurred vision over here, but with glasses, I can see fine. Um, and this eye is almost like tunnel vision. I can see things really far away. So I have the kind of vision that doctors tell me they see once every 10 years. Right. So, so you're, you're short sighted in one eye and long sighted in the other. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So did that affect reading then? 
Um, not for me. Uh, I so learning to read and everything was was still was still okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't start to have vision problems until I was in my late twenties, okay. um, which was about the same time that my mom lost her vision. Uh, right. But she taught me to read when I was little. I've always loved books, especially romance. So she instilled that in me, and, and I used to read to her. Really, and you weren't. Yeah. You weren't reading the the sort of racy no. romance that you've written. No, <laughs> I, was reading, I was reading children's books. Okay, but I was right. reading her. Right. So, what kind of stuff were you? Can you remember some of the authors you liked, or some of the titles? Um, I, they were mostly like the the Cinderella, uh, Beauty and the Beast. You know, all of those were the they live happily ever after. I would love to read those to her over and over. The only other book that I would read to her was the Bible. Okay, right. And half of so, that, you know, I didn't yeah. understand what I was reading, but yeah, yeah, did. yeah. Some gruesome stuff in there, though. Goodness me! <laughs> yeah, a lot of drama, <laughs> especially in that Old Testament. Goodness me! Some of that is like uh, full on. Yeah, some of it. Yeah. Some of it's like adults only. Uh, what's in the Old Testament? Um, I think it was, um, I wish I could remember which comedian it was. I'm going to say Lewis Black. I think it was Lewis Black. I'm not sure who said that uh, he didn't know what happened to God. The, the God. the God in the Old Testament versus the God in the New Testament. The God in the New Testament is a lot more easygoing. <laughs> And he says he doesn't yeah. know what happened to him. Maybe after the birth of his son, he mellowed a bit or something. <laughs> that, that's a good line. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So as a writer, obviously, you've got to have an active imagination. And yeah. uh, you you developed an active imagination or you had an active imagination. But unfortunately, I... having an active imagination got you into a lot of trouble. Yes, it did. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, Can you talk did. about it? I mean, I don't want to pry, but I just thought no, 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 no. to get I, a, a fully rounded about. picture of who you are and what you're about, it yeah. might be helpful. I am very open about it. Um, I will say honestly, uh, it, just to put it out there for those who don't know, I have been uh, incarcerated in the past. I did three years in a federal prison here in the U.S. Uh, you must have done something pretty fraud. serious. For what was it called? wire fraud so what I've, does that mean i don't think we have i don't think we, we must have that but i don't think we call it that in the uk what is wire fraud well i literally moved money from one place to another without permission how does that get you three years well is that money laundering um not money laundering but it is considered a white collar crime so you know you have to be educated to do that kind of thing is how they're thinking so you're not a dangerous criminal so you so get were you, less were you time hiding it from the from the irs or something why was it a crime to move uh, money well because it was, was not, it not your money, money? <laughs> it was not your money <laughs> that'll do it okay yeah okay. The, the easiest way to say it is i took money that didn't belong to me and i moved it from one place to another okay and i right, didn't I have see. permission to do it so i see um, okay so yeah. it's, it's it's a theft crime Right. It must have been a sizable amount of money to, for three years to be the sent first offense. Yeah. yeah, it was. And that's all well, I'm going to say about that. <laughs> OK, fine. OK, well, Let's we can... put it this way. I still, I'm still trying to pay it back. <laughs> I see. Well, that's good that you're going to make it right. So they don't take the three years as payment back to society. They actually want their money no, as I, well. I, yeah, I wish they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. And so what was federal prison like then? Um, I was in what they call a camp, which is supposed to be the lightest possible. You know, everybody seems to think, uh, at least here in America, thinks that uh, a prison camp means that, you know, I get to play tennis and, you know, and I go out on the golf range and I still eat four course meals. And it's not that. Yeah. Okay. Um, it just means that there's less security. So there aren't armed guards walking around uh you know there may not be razor wire fencing um i mean literally if i wanted to i could have walked out the fr front gate at any time 
Yeah, that you wouldn't know, have been a great um, move, though, if you wanted to get out inside no, the time that was no, allotted to you. Yes. No, yeah. No, no, no. Because then they so give you were low. You, you were low risk prison. You were you weren't with hardcore dangerous people. You were with people right. who were low risk who'd maybe committed similar crimes that that didn't involve you know any kind of threats or the, the kind. So yeah. yeah. In, most cases, in most cases, although you can be in a, a maximum or a higher security and because of good behavior, you know, towards the end of your sentence, get moved. Um, I see. I, I was there with some very interesting people. <laughs> I bet. And have you, have you managed to use any of that kind of experience as research for characters in books since? I have. Um, Tempting Tanya is the first book in a four book series. Mm -hmm. So the fourth book, the character, the main female character is also an ex-convict. So I use a lot of that knowledge for her character. Wow. They say, write what you know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So an experience that I can't even imagine, but having your freedom, no matter how, no matter how, um, safe it may feel because i'm guessing the biggest worry if you went to prison was the other prisoners but no matter how safe you may feel having your freedom taken away for that amount of time must have been an, a hell of experience how did it change you um it makes you appreciate things once you get home one of okay. the biggest freedoms that people think about you know or, or don't think about is the ability to go to the bathroom whenever you need to go and sometimes in prison, you don't get that. You know, if we're under some sort of lockdown and you're supposed to be in a certain space, you can't leave that space until they tell you to. Right. So, you know, um, unless you've got a nice officer who will allow you to do whatever it is you need to do, sometimes you're, you're just stuck there holding, you know, until they tell you it's okay. So little freedoms mean a lot more to me now than it did before. So do you find you're more grateful for everything now? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. good because I, I say that's good because I have thought for a long time that the key to happiness in life is being grateful, gratitude. I don't yes. think you can be happy unless you're grateful. And I think some of the unhappiest people I've ever met are people who are entitled or feel entitled because when you feel entitled you have no gratitude because if you get something you think well i was entitled to it and if you don't right. get it you think hey i'm entitled to that either way you're not happy whereas yeah. if something happens or you get something cool or something something just goes your way you go wow that's really you, you know you the, the gratitude comes through and the happiness thrives so having the experience you had, I could understand maybe it's made you happier in a bizarre way. <laughs> you know, not that it, you it would has. have given the choice to get to the gratitude place, you would have gone that way, but that's where you are and you can be grateful for that. But I can honestly say that before prison, I did live a life of entitlement. I felt like I should have certain things. It didn't matter if I earned them or deserved them. I just felt like, hey, I should have this. And that's what got me into trouble. Right. That's yeah. Entitlement is me. bad. It's bad. It's yeah, bad. It is it's really yeah. bad. And now it, I do, I feel really blessed for everything that I do have. Um, even if it's not exactly what I want, you know, I know now that I can work through whatever it takes to get there. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you've come out of the, you've come out the other side of it with a real positive mindset. And I was reading a little bit about uh, your journey uh, and prison. And it turns out that there was actually a good side to going to prison and that's to do with your health. Absolutely. I will tell anybody, and usually what I tell people is everything happens for a reason. And part of, I think the reason for me going was because I was not looking after my health and I found out about three months before I was due to come home that I had thyroid cancer and it was huge. Um, it was, I was at the beginning of stage four, which means literally I was about to die. Cause um, there are only four stages, aren't there? Right. And I was at the point where it was spreading through my body. And, um, 
if you make a fist and you put your hand on top of that, that's about how big the tumor was that they took out of me. The cancer was that big. And it was in my throat. I still wow. have my little scar here. I tell everybody that I got shanked in prison. <laughs> <laughs> Make you a bit more rock and roll, a bit more hardcore. <laughs> so are you, are you saying that they wouldn't have found that if you weren't in prison? I don't think so because I wasn't taking care of myself. I And, and the crazy part was I had health insurance. Um, you know, doctors are readily available here, but I wasn't going to see doctors. I was like, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm overweight, but no big deal, you know. Yeah. Um, so I had no idea until I got to prison and I, I dropped a lot of weight. Um, and most of the weight loss was not from the tumor, but from actually getting movement. And you could see it on this side. It was huge. Wow. Once I lost weight, you know, they thought I had a goiter. Right. And yeah. then they, they sent me out to the hospital there um, and had me looked at. And, you know, a couple of days after that, they told me, OK, you've got cancer and we got to cut it out. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. But and you're near the end of you're near, you're, you're near the end of your sentence as well. You're thinking this this part of this ordeal is nearly over. Oh, hello, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was afraid when they found out because I had nothing but good time. So I was getting out about ten months before my sentence was up, and I was really excited. And I kept thinking, Oh my God, they're going to keep me here because they're going to have the surgery, and I'm going to have to stay. Um, but that's not what happened. I literally had my surgery two weeks before I got released. Wow. And, and you're good now? I'm great. I have been cancer free ever since. Ding dong. Yeah, that is yeah. great. That is really, really good. So do you look yeah. after yourself now? You take care of yourself a bit better? Oh, definitely. I see the doctor. I have a, 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 a big group of doctors that I see. I have cancer doctors and eye doctors and y you name it. I go see them all yeah. every year. Yeah. Okay. Well, what a story. You know, you, you, you can do your, your autobiography. You could call, you know, how prison saved my life. I don't know. I you don't know, know, that's not a bad title. I might use <laughs> Take it. Take it. So let's talk about writing now. So when did you start writing? Um, the crazy part is I've probably been writing since I was about 10 years old. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have any of that stuff. But the serious writing, I think, started maybe a year or two before I went to prison. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I sat down and was like, I like romances. I should write a romance. And, well, you know what? I take that back. It's not two or three years. It was actually in the mid nineties, I think, um, that the, my very first book that I published, I wrote more than 20 years ago. And it was published. It was, I published it self published, but yeah. it, it was independently back, published. That's what you say now. You don't, you don't say self published anymore. You say I, it's independently published. Because we're in a different world. <laughs> yes, be positive. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I looked at it. I found it in some old stuff I was going through after I got home, and I was like, "Oh my god!" All of the technology references were so outdated. They in the book they had pagers, and they had to go to pay phones, which here you can't find a pay phone on any corner. No, you I don't can't think hear anymore. No. Seen a pager. Um, you know, so I was like, OK, I got to update all the technology references. So it was the first book I put out called The Right Kind of Love. Um, and, you know, I, I was amazed that I made four hundred dollars the first month, you know, off of it. I was like, oh, my God, somebody actually is reading my crap. <laughs> <laughs> and was that a romance book? Yes. Yes, it was. Um all of my books have been uh, interracial romance, uh, usually black, female, white, male. And this was which is what Tempting Tanya is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, that is definitely my genre, the interracial romance genre. Um, but, you know, it, and I, I want to go back and rewrite it now that I think I've found my <laughs> voice because I think yeah. it could be so much better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about Tempting Tanya. It is an interracial romance. 
So why yeah. that genre then? Why why do you like the interracial romance? What is it about that 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 turns you on? Uh, because I I wish that we all saw each other without color. You okay. know, I wish that you didn't look at someone and see a black female or a Mexican man or a white guy. You know, that it was just, hey, that's Bobby. Oh, that's Judy. You know. Yeah. But yeah. So I was like, well, I'll just write about couples that way. And then I was like, well, I'm a black woman. I should write about black women. Yeah. And because you're going to write what you know. Yeah. And it didn't seem like there were a lot of those kinds of books when I wrote the first one um, 20 years ago. But now there's a lot of them and yeah. some of them are really good. And so I decided to just stick with that. So have you have you been in an interracial relationship yourself? <laughs> Several. Um, <laughs> okay, you are right in what you know. <laughs> Several, and and I will say a lot of the the experiences that the the characters have do come from real life situations, whether they're mine or people that I know. Um, I will tell you honestly, most of my friends are white people. I only have like two black friends, period. Right. Um, I don't know why that is. In fact, one of the people while I was in uh, incarcerated, uh, she actually told me that I was not a black woman. She said, you're just masquerading as a black girl. You're actually a white girl in a black girl spot. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's even a compliment though. I, I'm not sure it was either, but I know she didn't mean anything bad by it. Oh, okay. But, right, okay. But I think, because I honestly, once I got to know her, I realized that she's from a small town. She's probably not used to being around, you know, black people. So she's used to a certain type of black right. person, I guess. And, okay. you know, she was just like, no, you're you're not black. You're, you're just a white girl in a chocolate body. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, let's... You say so. <laughs> Let's talk about the characters. You say the situations came from real life. I want to talk about the characters, but you, but let's quickly talk about that. Is there a situation? Because, you know, Tempting Tanya, the shorthand is it's an interracial romance. But this is a thriller, too. This is a thriller. Yeah. You know, there's a yeah. lot of jeopardy. There's danger that you've put into the story that keeps you hanging on. There's a there's a there's a mystery to it, you know. There's there's a there's almost a, a who done it, you know, because you're trying to work out. There's a I'm not want to give too much away, but I want to let anybody watching this know that this isn't just a straight romance, interracial or not. It's not a straight romance. This is a thriller with a story with somebody's life in danger, and you don't know who or why. And then you've got someone comes along to protect this person because they care for them very much. And so there's all all that going on. Before we talk about characters, which I wanted to do, but can we, I know this is, we're going a long way here. You said some of the situations in Tempting Tanya come from real life. Have you had an experience similar to what Tanya had? Because she is also a writer in the book. Have you had a similar experience to that, as scary as, as what Tanya went through? Uh, no, thank God. Good. Um, I, I, the worst I've had is internet stalkers. Um, okay. But that's kind of where the idea came from. I, I I get weird messages from men all the time. And I, I don't know if they're reading the material and thinking, oh, my God, she's got to be this way or that. But uh -huh. that's where the idea came from. I was like, well, what if as a writer, you know, you get this person who literally is insane enough to try and kidnap you, yeah. you know, and is sending you weird stuff, you know? So yeah. that's where it came from. Luckily, I have not experienced that. Right. And what about the inspiration for the characters? Let's run through a few of my favorite characters in the book. Mike, who is an all around good guy. Um, he's a businessman, but he's also I mean, he works as a, as a, as he protects people. That's his business. So he's, yeah. he's physical and he's, you know, he'd, he'd be good to hang out with whether you're a, whether you're a lady or whether you're just a wimpy bloke like me to have a friend like Mike would be <laughs> kind of handy, make you feel good. Where did the inspiration for him come from? Um, believe it or not, that actually came from the movie, The Bodyguard. Did it really? <laughs> did it really? It's yeah, I get that favorite. now. 
And I love Kevin Costner. And I was like, but what if we made him a little beefier and a little yeah. more hunky, you know? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's that's got to be who Mike is. He's that guy. He's not afraid to to protect someone with his own life if necessary. But he's also one of those kind of guys that all the girls just go, oh. <laughs> There's a great scene when he first arrives. Like I said, I don't want to give too much away. But uh, let me just say he's naked and has a gun pointed at him. Uh, <laughs> let me just say that. And it really is good. Okay. So how about Ella? She was one of my favorites. Even though she's really not a main central character to the story, I think she kind of she holds it together and she's able to tell what Mike's backstory is as well. I loved Ella. Yeah. I thought she was great. Yeah. Where does she come from? Um, Ella is, is a little bit like my mom. Yeah. And, Great. Your uh, mom was like Ella. Well, that would have been nice. Yeah. My mom, she, she would say what was on her mind. In fact, the, the scene where she's going to watch, uh, Wendy Williams. Yes. That on TV. was actually a scene that happened in real life. My, that happened between me and my mom. She's drinking her, her drink and she goes, you know, I'm going to go watch Wendy. And she's, she calls her, she said that horse face girl. And I was like, who are you talking about? You know, and I was like, she was like that new girl, Wendy. And I was like, Wendy Williams? And she's like, yeah, she looks like a Clydesdale. And I went, oh my God. So when I was writing that part of the book, it just came to me and I was like, it's got to go in the book. It's got to go in the book. So Yeah, well, I got to that in reverse because we don't have Wendy Williams on TV here. And I wasn't even sure she was a real TV personality. I thought you, you may have made her up, you know? And yeah. so I looked her up and sure enough, when I went, yeah, she does look a bit like a horse. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, then it all made sense. So I came at it backwards. Um, yeah, because awesome. that's why when, when I first recorded it, I didn't get her catchphrase right, and you you had to school me on that, and uh, and I got there in the end, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about the fact that you might not know who she was, you know, when, when you got to that part, and I said, oh, I'm going to have to show him how to do this, <laughs> and so I was like, I got to find some clips that show her, and, and I actually found that one of her, and I was like, oh, this is perfect, Yeah, you know, because my yeah. mom used to do it. How you doing? And it was just <laughs> <laughs> But then I had to do it, a weedy white guy from England. I can't believe I got away with it. But you did an excellent job. You really did. Well, I'm not going to do it again now, just in case I get it wrong. I've, I, the, if, if you want to hear me do Wendy Williams, then you have to get the book. It's called Tempting Tanya. In fact, I'll tell you how you can get it. If you've watched this far into our chat, if you want to get a free copy, hang on just a little bit, and I'll, I'll tell you how you can download the book, the audio book, for free. So we'll get to that soon. But we're, we're talking about the characters now. So we got to Ella. How about Mike's brothers? Where do they come from? Oh, my God. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to start with Carl because I absolutely love Carl. Um, when I was creating the characters, I had already picked out the names, but I had no idea what his personality was going to be. And then I started to think about um, my, I have a brother, like I said, and um, while we're not close at one point, you know, he thought he was this bad guy, you know, like he was just all of that. And I was like, I should put that. He's cocky, but he's still a little unsure of himself, especially around his girlfriend. Yeah. And he's and, got a hard um, shell, I, hasn't he? He's he's so sensitive right, but, to protect himself from the world, he's had to build a hard shell. That's how exactly. I saw him. Exactly. Yeah. You you nailed his character. When I heard the voice, I went, Oh my God, this is perfect. <laughs> you know? Um, but his character literally kind of formed itself after I got that little nugget of he's, he's a bad guy, but he's actually a good guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. All the brothers yeah, are good though, aren't they? They're all good side men to they Mike. They are all awesome. <laughs> yeah, they are. And, and how about Tanya's sisters and sister and her cousins? Um, the is, sister is your sister Betty. in there? That, that she's a lot of Betty. She is a yeah. lot of Betty. Yeah. Um, my sister is one of those people who 
loves you with food. She okay. feeds you all the time. And, you know, if you come over to her house, you're either eating while you're there or you're leaving with plastic containers full of food. That's yeah. just how she is. Yeah. Um, and my sister is also very bossy and nosy. Yeah. Um, I love that because it means that she cares. Yeah. But I was like, okay, I, I got to kind of put this into the character a little bit. And her arguing with uh, her love interest in her book also comes from that. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. And how did you find the process of turning your work into an audiobook? Have you done an audiobook before? This was the very first one. Okay. So this was a whole new experience for you. How did yes. you find it? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Initially, I thought I would put my own books on audio, but um, I'm so glad that I got your audition because I had heard one other person and I was like, eh, she's okay. But then when you, uh, I heard your voice and I could differentiate each of the characters in those scenes, I went, oh, I gotta have this guy. And that's when I researched you. I researched you and I was like, oh yeah, definitely. Graham Mac is the one, he's the one. No, I, I don't need to hear anybody else. That's so nice because that, I try very hard at that, that I, I, I will I make each character. So I want the listener listening to the book. When someone starts talking, it's not like, a, uh, you know, you, you, they can't see you. So right. and it's not like a play where the word comes up first or whatever. Often you don't find out who's talking till the end of the line because that's the nature of how a book is written. So there'll be a line and then it'll say, Mike said. I want you to know that it's Mike before you get to that bit. I'll still read Mike said, but I want you to know. And I want the person listening when they hear the next voice to know that it is a different person and to also, as they get through the book, to know who it is straight away. Because I think it yeah. just makes it more enjoyable as a listen than having to go, wait, who's talking now? Having to wait to get to the end of the sentence to find out. Because right. when you're reading, that's fine. Right. It's, it's totally fine when you're reading. But I think when you're listening, just to make it easier to listen to, and, and I want to make it as easy for the listener to listen to, because I just want to get your story across. Because it's such a great story i mean like i say thriller and it never lets up it keeps you guessing right till the very very end and then you know and it's left it open to go somewhere else and yeah oh i'm so pleased you enjoyed how it came out i really am yeah yes i'm i'm totally thrilled i i every time you sent me you know the next clips to listen to i would go running because I, I live with my best friend and her brothers and i literally would go you've got to hear this you've got to hear that he did this this is incredible i picked the right man <laughs> oh thanks so what is next for kimberly smith um i am now working on a spin-off series from carl's motorcycle club great um, that'll be good there's still going to be some mystery and some thriller because you know he he and his club believe in the protection and care of women yeah. so each one of these, these men and there are a few women that will have their own books too um each one of their situations will revolve around helping or rescuing a woman or a child and will carl find love with somebody special carl already has um we'll get to those books for you to do because they're part of that tempting tanya series oh um, okay yeah, so so her yeah. sister Betty is the second book. Uh, her cousin Eden and Carl are the third. So all four of his brother, all of his brothers, all four of them end up with women related to Tanya. Great. So great. So it's a family affair. <laughs> yeah, that is good. That is cool. I look forward to doing those. Now, Tempting Tanya is out now. It's an ebook. It's also a, a, an audio book. Is it a physical book too? Yes, I do have a paperback, um, yeah. and you can get it on Amazon. Yeah, or so you, you can, can get, buy it get, direct from my site. From your site? What's the address of your site? Uh, CreativeKRS.com. Just kind of okay. like my shirt there. I don't know if you can okay. See if you can't see it on on if you can't see it on Kimberly's shirt there, I'm going to put a link in the description if you watch this on YouTube to to the website there. Just give us it again. What is it? It's Creative. K R S my initials Kimberly Renee Smith yes. dot com. Oh, oh, right, got it. Okay, K K R S dot com. 
That's it. Yes. Okay. And if you missed that, and I don't see how you could, but if you did, there is a link in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Now, talking of links in the description, if you would like a free download of Tempting Tanya, I've got that for you too. The next 10 people that send me an email to the email address I've got below, and that's graham at macmedia.co.uk, but you probably can't remember that, but there's a link below. Just send me an email and say, I'd like a free copy, a free download of Tempting Tanya. The next 10 people that do that, I will send you, I'll reply to that email with a code. You click on that, you click on, there'll be a link and a code and you click on the thing on, or it'll send you to a page on Audible. It'll ask you for the code that I've sent you. You put the code in and you'll download the audiobook for free. No catch, nothing. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to sign up to Audible if you don't want. There's, there'll be a way to sign up to Audible for trial. You don't have to do that. If you like it, just, no. I mean, it would be nice if after you've listened to it and you like it, you'd put a nice review up because that helps everybody out but it's just a free download of the audiobook just email me at the email address you'll see in the link there and just tell me you'd like the free audiobook and, uh, and i'll set you up uh kimberly smith the book is called tempting tanya it's a great book it's great to talk to you amazing life you've had you've survived two major challenges in your life cancer being one of them uh congratulations on everything so far looking forward to working with you again thank you absolutely